<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Roundtable, episode number 38. Uh, I am your host, Wade Finnegan, and I am joined tonight by John Ward, the Thunder from Down Under, Carl Sinclair, um, special guest host, Kristen Harbour, I can't believe we didn't scare her away, uh, the incredulous <laughs> David W. Wright, and of course, Trish McCallan. And our guest for tonight is historical romance author uh, Courtney Milan, who proves that law degrees make really good uh, ways to get into being an author, um, and also is uh, very good at doing translation and, uh, and uh, going to talk to us about that subject tonight. How's everybody doing? Wonderful. I am fantastic. Hanging in there. Good. Good. The Courtney, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate thank, it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, you, you're uh, when we posted this generated some quite quite a bit of buzz. I think a lot of self uh, published authors want to know how to get their book translated, what it takes, and all those things. But before we dive into the topic, you want to just give us a, a brief introduction of yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Courtney Milan. I'm a historical romance author. I have been self publishing since 2011. Um, I originally started out writing books with Harlequin uh, for their single title, Historical Romance Line, and then uh, the royalty rate at the time on digital was 8% of cover. Wow. Little, yeah, I know. Generous. I know. And there's, isn't that sweet? They actually, they actually very nicely uh, agreed to increase it to 25% to for single title authors after I left and wrote a post. <laughs> Um, Shame them into doing the right thing. Well, you know, I don't. I actually don't think I had anything to do with it, just because I think the, um, the 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 time between my announcement and their announcement was so small. They're a large corporation. I think they have they'd need more time to come to that kind of decision. But you know, I'll take credit. No, just kidding. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, I should mention too, just a, a brief aside here. Uh, Brenna Aubrey is also on with us tonight. Hi, Brenna. Hey guys. Sorry about that. that oh, no funny. worries. Okay, Glad cool. to have you. Another person that we haven't scared away, which I can't believe. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So we got a great panel for tonight. So, uh, Trish, you want to uh, start off with a question or two? Okay. Um, so basically, there's a tremendous amount of interest in translations, and uh, there's a lot of misinformation going around out there as well, and a lot of translators that are charging fairly cheap prices but then not doing a very good job and it's such a bad job in some cases that the the distributors won't even accept the um, the work there's been a couple of people that I've heard of that have been turned away so when you said that you had been um, translating your books into uh, German Spanish French and uh, Italian. Um, I really wanted you to come on and kind of just give us a history of how you got into the translations and what you looked for and basically kind of just fill us in on what you did. Okay, uh, that's a very, uh, let, me, let me give you the short version of this. This started actually in 2011 and I made my first uh, agreement to do enter into a translation deal with a translator before I had even self-published my first work. And what happened was uh, I knew I was going to be self-publishing something um, and I had a friend who had a translator who, um, her, she was, she's traditionally published. Her books were published by Blonde Ballet in Germany. And her translator had emailed her to ask her some questions about the book saying, you know, I, I want to make sure that I translate this according to your intent. Do you mean this or do you mean this? Um, and so, uh, she had this, this contact information, and we knew that Amazon had just opened up in Germany, and we said, eh, why not try it? So we emailed her and asked her if she'd be willing to work with us on a self-published basis, and she said, sure. And she told us how much it would cost, and I said, ooh, okay, uh, interesting. But it, it was a novella, and so it was short. And so I looked at the amount of money involved, and I said, okay, well, I'm just going to take this not as a money-generating opportunity, but as sort of an information-gathering um, Thing, that I'm going to release something and get a feel for what the German ebook market looks like when it's young and maybe this will give me a way to know when it starts getting big and see if this is viable. So I sort of lucked into doing it right the first time around, which is that I had a translator who um, was, is one of the best translators in, in Germany for, for my subgenre of historical romance. 
Um, and when you go on German blogs and people talk about translators and the people who read um, works in translation obviously think about the translator a lot and they have favorites and they know who's good and they know who maybe is sort of doing a, a crummy job and that's even with the ones that traditional publishers are hiring. Um, so, so I was really lucky that I got her and that we started having a good relationship that way. Um, so that's, that's sort of how I started and then once I had done Germany um, you know, I did the first one and then I waited like a year because the, the market was young and um, the cost was high and then I did the second, a second novella in German and then that was doing okay and I sort of like squeezed my eyes shut and said, okay, we'll do a full length book, but it cost a lot of money and I was scared and it turned out really well and I'm, I'm happy I did it and I said, at some point I said to myself, you know, I'm not sure that the standard offer that they make to romance authors, and you know, in in some parts, some countries in Europe, the way they treat romance, it's like a magazine almost. Like literally, in fact, you can go, you can if you look at some of the books, they they have like magazine covers. They're they're so disposable, it's not even funny, and they just cycle them through really fast. And I was thinking to myself, okay, look, that's not that's not what I want to happen to my books. Um, I want to build an audience. I don't want to be just like a product that's on the shelf and then gone. You know. I'm not sure that I'm going to take a deal that's offered by any of these publishers. So I started thinking about um, going into other languages. So for reference purposes, I have been translating in German for, at this, it's 2014, right? So two and a half years now. Um, I just started French and Spanish. Like literally, the French version has been up for a day and a half of my first book. Um, and I should say my first novella, um, my Spanish version, I got the email from Amazon uh, less than an hour ago saying, your book is available in the Kindle store. Um, and uh, Italian, we're still working out details. So, so that's kind of where I am in the process. Um, but I think the most important thing is to have a good translator. Um, and that's also the hardest thing because you don't speak the language. How can you go about finding a good translator? Um, how do you evaluate that since you don't speak the language? Well, there's two things. Um, one of the things that I do, and it's extremely time intensive, is go on Amazon in the language you're looking to translate into. Um, and usually they have a translator listed, and if not, you can do the search inside and look at the, like the, the, the copyright page and the list of translator there. Look for books that are by people in your genre because I think, I really do think that genre matters here. Um, you know, if somebody's been translating all science fiction, there's like, there's like a way that people talk about spaceships and stuff and if somebody has been translating historical romance and they've never translated science fiction before, you know, they might get that wrong, right? Or if somebody has only been translating, um, you know, the, if somebody has never translated historical romance, then they might get the, the forms of address wrong, like what, what do you call a duke um, in Spanish? Like, and if that's wrong, then the readers are going to be upset. So look for people in your genre, and then see if you can find contact information for them and email them. Right? So look for good people to begin with, people that you know are good, people that are being used by publishing houses, and talk to them. That's, so that's the number one thing that I do. Um, it's hard because it's very difficult to find contact information. Um, but, you know. Is that how you found your translators then for your French and Italian and yes. Spanish? Uh, French and Spanish, yes. The Italian one, I haven't actually signed a contract with the translator I'm thinking about yet, so uh, I'm not going to, but, but, but it, I actually found her sort of by Googling uh, as many random keywords as I could in my not very good Italian and trying to find one that would give something useful. It was not really very pretty. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, it's but I mean like, and that's I, I'm looking very specifically for a historical romance translator um, who has experience doing it in the past, who enjoys it. I mean, I'd also be willing to take somebody who's a translator who likes reading historical romance. Um, but I think that that's sort of a must. Like, if you you can't have somebody translating your books who does not like reading the subgenre they're translating in, like you can't. Um, would you mind sharing? Um what you're paying per translation, are they charging you by um, the word? I've heard of people that are charging by the product versus people that are charging by the word. Have you have you ran into a cons consistent 
um, amount of money that, that the good translators are expecting. And are there people that will do a royalty split? Okay, so the, so first of all, there's a, um, the, the, tr the, the charges are going to depend on the country, and um, it, it depends a lot on, on the country and the language. So um, Spanish is a lot cheaper than um, French. And German. Uh, German is less expensive than French. French is the most expensive for a number of reasons that probably have to do with um, um, taxation and uh, various other things I don't really understand. But French is definitely the most expensive. Um, in terms of actual costs, uh, the last book I translated into German um, was about 102,000 words in English. Um, I pay the way that she is paid is on a per pay, per translated page basis, um, and when you factor in the cost of the translation itself, plus um, I pay an editor as well. Uh, I think I spent about eight thousand eighty five hundred dollars on that, so uh, it's a nice chunk of change. Um, uh, the same book in Spanish is probably going to be about four thousand. Or so, four or five thousand. Um, in French, it's probably going to be close to ten thousand. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much money we're talking about. Um, so it, we're not talking. It, it, this is this is not cheap. Um, do you find proofreaders after you have your editor look at it, or do you have beta readers within the, the subgenre and? native speakers? Um, I, I do find proofreaders. Uh, one of the things that I have been doing is just asking the translators themselves if they know somebody who has experience working in proofreading and publishing um, because as a general rule they're going to pick... I, I have the, the first time I did it in German I got proofreaders and like you know I just went to like Odesk or something and hired the cheapest people I could find and that was a mistake because the people were not necessarily um, Native speakers of the language. Let's just say that. Okay. I've heard yeah. like Elance nightmares. Yeah. Um, I think you could find good people on Elance, but you'd have again, you'd have to know what you're looking for. Right. So um, I actually think that asking the translator themselves, like if they've been working in publishing, they probably know other people who've been working in publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, why not try it? You said something about. Um, Intent, like, do you mean this or do you mean that? So, is it a fairly hands-on process working with the translator, or do you just set the standard initially and they go from there? It depends on the translator. Okay. My German translator is we we talk a lot more than others, partially because I speak a little bit of German, and so sometimes she'll she'll send me comments about I'm not sure how I'm going to translate this little um you know like innuendo or something like you you know something that has double meaning in English. And she's like, there's no good word in German that, that you know, means both poke, as in, like, you know, jab at someone, and also, you know, to have sex with, right? Nice. And so how am I going to translate this, you know? There's, a, there's this line in my book where, where uh, I think it's, the, the line is something like, well, you know, uh, they're referring to my heroine as a mouse, and that somebody says, well, you know, all my squeal when they're poked. And she was like, I'm not sure how to translate that. So we actually talked about that back and forth and came up with uh, all my squeal when they see a snake, uh, which works in German. <laughs> but, you know, she and I are very hands-on. Um, it's not quite the same. I, I haven't had quite the same experience working with some of the other translators, but that's also fine. I just think that's just the way she is. And does that become more of their intellectual property? I, mean, I think that I've heard that. Actually. Yes, Okay. So this is, you know, wait a sec. Before we get there, there was a question about royalty shares. Um, and these things are actually related, so um, I want to come back and talk about that briefly. Um, I have not done a, a strict royalty split with a translator, like a 50-50 split or something along those lines, um, simply because most of the translators won't work on that basis. Um, you can find some who do. But I think most of the experienced translators have a choice between working for you or working for a publishing house. Um, and they're not going to work for you if they're not sure they're going to get paid. You know, that's just kind of the way it works. So I have not done a strict royalty split with no upfront money. Um, I, I'm sure that, some, some, that that will happen at some point. 
uh, but I just haven't seen it. So that's um, thing number one. Uh, thing number two. Um, uh, okay, so the thing to understand if you live in the United States is that the United States has copyright laws. That is, our laws on copyright um, deal specifically with the right to make copies and the right to make derivative works. They're all about rights along those lines. Um, we are kind of alone in the, the world in that sense. Um, everyone else has certain moral rights that attach to the creation of a work, um, and they attach to translators as well as, as others. And, you know, we can do stuff in the United States, like, say, this was going to be work for hire, and I'm going to own all the copyrights um, once you're done. That does not exist in uh, some countries, or at least it doesn't exist for literary works. Uh, to the extent that you might want. And so, yes, your translator, uh, in many instances, owns the intellectual property involved. And there are also some things that, that come along with that. Um, anyone who's worked with a U.S. publishing house knows that they will change things in your manuscript and not ask you about it. They can't, you can't necessarily do that to somebody else's intellectual property, right? I could not make a change to my uh, German translator's work without getting her permission. Um, so when something gets proofread, I send it back to her, and she takes a look at it and decides whether it's going to go or stay. Um, she's the ultimate decision maker on that. Um, some countries, and this is, this is going to sound completely bizarre to Americans, and nobody ever believes me on this, but I swear to God, it's true. If you're, if you're, you're lying. I am lying. No, uh, but if your translator lives in Germany or France, there are laws that say that you have to give them a royalty percentage. You have to. Okay, you can't not. Even if you're playing them at paying them a flat, flat fee, it might right. be that royalties don't kick in until you've sold a certain, you know, a certain number of copies down the line, right? And so you wouldn't have to pay that royalties until you've already earned a ton of money and made something out of it. But but you have to pay a royalty fee. I have um, a, 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 on the copyright thing. You said uh, the translators have, you know, you. Know, a copyright on that. Can they then create derivative works of it, like on their like another no. book? No, oh, okay. you're essentially joint owners. Uh, it's 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 a little it's complicated. Okay, it's complicated. They they don't they have a copyright in the translation. They don't have a copyright in the underlying work. Okay. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, one of the things that I suggest for anyone who's thinking about doing this is that if you are thinking about translating, you're putting in a lot of money, right? These are expensive. If I want to do my whole four book series in French, it's going to cost me $40,000, right? And so if you're going to spend that much money, talk to local counsel, right? So I'm a former lawyer, and this is going to come through in some ways. You know, it's not like I hired an intellectual property attorney in France to look at my contract with it and, and to talk about, uh, to tell me what I needed to be aware of. And it cost me like $700 to do that. And I feel like seven hundred dollars is a reasonable price to pay if you're about to invest forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's my thought. So so I think translation, the way I'm doing it is expensive. There are probably some people who have a less expensive way to do it. This is this is kind of the way I'm doing it. It's expensive. Um, Courtney, uh Carl here, there's a question uh, that was asked uh, earlier in the week on the website for you. Uh, it's from one of our viewers, Erica. And she was looking into German translation. She said she stumbled across results of a survey that were taken by a German literary translator um, and included information like cost per word, character line, and they were charging royalty rates as well. Um, she said the latter caught her attention. She realized the translation, translation, uh, sorry, the translator's translation mm -hmm. of your writing is their intellectual property. So is it? where the royalty part comes in, kind of what you were just talking about, I guess. Yeah. Uh, was this the translator's IP and or royalties an issue, and did it come up with you? I think you uh, up. Yeah, I have to pay my German translator royalties. I do. Um, and actually, I'm really happy to do that because she's. it makes her a lot more interested in making sure the books do well. Um, she's, she's very, very excited to get royalty statements from me. Um, so... I like that. She likes that. We all like it. So you issue the royalty statement. Correct. From your company, like if you have a company. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I, Darren has a question, and um, that is, do you have your translations done in audio? No. Have you thought about it, or why not? Uh, I have thought about it. Um, at this point, here's the thing. Uh, I just don't think I'd earn my money back. Okay. Has I, audio I, even really ca caught on in, in those other markets really yet? I don't. I don't know. Um, honestly, like, let me rephrase it. I might earn my money back, but it might take me like 10 years. Yeah. And that's outside my time frame, right? Like, I expect, like, for my German works when I release them, at this point, I earn the money that I put into the translation back in about a month and a half, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, for, for French, I think Spanish will take me longer. Like, I'm putting these works out, and I'm expecting that I'm probably not going to make money for at least a year. Um, I'm hoping that French is a slightly smaller time frame. Um, but uh, when I when I multiply that by audio and the smaller percentage of audio readers, I just I'm not I'm not seeing it. it I don't think that's going to come out. Uh, we have a question on the website from Chris to W. Uh, Courtney, what if you hire the translator as effectively a W-2 employee rather than trying work for hire on a freelance basis? Does that potentially get around the moral rights? Uh, how are the big publishers getting around it? Because some of the articles I've read indicate that they are. Okay. Um, I don't think the big, the big publishers... First of all, I don't think the big publishers are getting around this. Um, and the reason I don't think that they are getting around this is because uh, they we hire them as a W-2 employee. That that just means that they're a contractor, right? They're not. I mean, that that's, that doesn't. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not understanding the premise of the question. W-2 would be your employee. 1099 would be your contractor. Okay, wait, wait. Maybe that's what she meant. Oh, okay. Um, she means she means actually physically hire them as an employee. No. I. Uh, do you, I do not want to hire someone in France. Okay. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Like, I no, don't, I, I, I don't want to hire not, anyone anywhere. I don't. Okay, I, I have a U.S. employee, and I know what a pain in the ass it is to do all the stuff you have to do for a U.S. employee. Right. right? I do not know French employment law. I do know. It's tough. It's actually very tough I in mean, France. Right. I was going to say, I do know that, like, I, it, it, I think it would raise my cost from, like, you know, ten thousand dollars a book to probably like twenty or thirty thousand dollars a book. I'd rather pay royalties. Shit. I'm sorry. Can I swear? <laughs> oh, oh hell yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. If you don't, we kick you off after an hour. <laughs> yeah, it's encouraged. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll have the next question actually that goes back to what you were talking about with the royalty um, share. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious. What um, do most authors then do? Kind of like an advance, so the ten thousand dollar payment would be towards like an advance on the royalties, and then once that um, that initial investment is kicked in, then the royalties kick in. Uh, I have it set up slightly different ways for different translators, um, but yes, that is one way to set it up. I mean, I I don't, to the best of my knowledge. I don't think it matters how you set it up as long as you're paying royalties at some point. Um, so yes, you could set it up so like the 10,000 is in advance and then you give them like, you know, X percent in royalties and once they've earned out that much and they start earning money. Like I don't see any reason you couldn't do that. What, what made you go uh, do the uh, translations in the first place? Were your books selling very well in, uh, in English to begin with and is that what drove you to do it? Um, well, for German, the first the reason I did it at first was had nothing to do with book sales because I actually, at the point when I made the agreement, I hadn't actually put anything for sale yet as a self-published author. So I had no idea how I was going to do. It was just uh, foolish throwing darts at in in the dark, and I I, I hit the board. So um, that's that's not right. I don't advise doing it that way. Um, uh, for the other for the other books, uh, one of the things that I look at is how many English copies I'm selling in foreign jurisdictions, um, and I think that that's a good guess for what the approximate um, what the demand is for that kind of book because there's a handful of people who 
I read in English and then you know about 10 times or 20 times that number who want to read in the native language and so if you're getting sales like a good number of sales on Amazon Germany or Amazon France for your English language books I think it's telling you that there's a demand for it and that if you translated it it might it might pan out so I that I think that's a, a good rule of thumb um, if you're not getting any sales at all in Amazon Germany then it tells you that people there don't have any idea who you are or don't read in that genre or you know it's going to be harder to break out so would you suggest to people that they do break out before they actually do translations well you know I don't or could translations help them break out if there's not a lot of you know English to that language translations honestly it's so expensive that I'm just not I mean I guess you have extra money to burn that you're not making off your books that you just want to throw into it. I mean you could there's nothing that says you can't but I don't know that I would advise anyone to go into translations if they weren't already making enough money on their books to fund the translation from sales of the books makes sense. When you have a new release or you have your translation ready, do you have a plan, a marketing plan, or do you have a way to uh, help move your book? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm kind of a shitty marketer mm -hmm. um, in general. Like basically the only way I know how to sell things is to make a newsletter and hope people sign up and encourage people to sign up for it and then send it out. Um, so what I did, uh, I have separate websites for every country that I'm in. So if you go to CourtneyMilan.d, um, it's a German language website that has my German language books. And it says sign up for my newsletter in German. Um, and then at the back of my books in German, it says sign up for my newsletter. Uh, and then uh, when, when people sign up, I have a new book out. I send out the email list and that sort of like bumps it up, you know, gets enough people to buy it that it bumps it up the rankings on you know the Am you know Amazon and everywhere else that I have it and that's sort of how I grease sales. I, at this point I have German language website, I have a German language Facebook, Facebook page, I have a French language website, a Spanish language website, the Spanish and French Facebook pages um, uh, and I have a list of bloggers that we send out review copies to and that's pretty much my marketing and I have no idea what else I could do beyond that. Courtney, about your newsletter that you send out, and um, do you get those translated obviously or? They're, they're super basic, right? It's like I have a new book out, here's the back cover copy which you know the translator has already done. Go mm -hmm. buy it, here's the links, right? So they're not, they're not super elaborate, I don't have a whole lot on them, it's just sort of like book here Bye. Thank you. Nice day. <laughs> right. So, so there's we, we did have to get some stuff that translated, but it's like, you know, such and such book is now available, right? So it that that's not that's not really a cost to worry about. Do you uh, change price points for the different markets too? Do you study that? Oh, that's a good. Okay, so here's something you need to know. Um, Germany, French, and Spain have book price fixing laws. Okay, you are not allowed to offer a book to one vendor at a different retail price than another one. And that makes it very difficult to change prices because they have to change at the same time. Um, so I don't do a lot of price point changing <clears throat> for that reason. Um, my translator and I have been talking about this and one of the ways we're going to get around this, I, I want to offer, I have this introductory novella to my series, I want to offer that for free to try and draw in more readers because, you know, why not? Um, and we've been trying to strategize how to do that and uh, she talked to her lawyer and what we came up with was that we can release a special bonus edition that has first chapters from all the other ones and that's now a separate work and then I put it up on all the venues I can do it for free all at once and then I'm okay but I have to do it that way. Oh, okay. so, so yeah they have it, the price fixing laws are, are kind of annoying. So. How do you originally price your books for each market, though? Do you each market has a little bit of a different price for each genre, doesn't it? Do you look at yeah. 
what's selling. Yeah, I look. I, that's exactly what I do. I look at the list and I see um, what's selling and wh what price points really sort of um, uh, stick in the marketplace. Not just what 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 is high at the moment, but what price points I see for you know indie published books that uh, tend to stay around for like a month, month and a half in the top 100 or so, and that's kind of what I'm shooting for as my price. Uh, Darren Wearmouth has a question on the uh, website. Uh, does Courtney have an agent? Would she consider or does she have traditional deals overseas? Apologies if this is a silly question. Not a silly question. I do have an agent. My agent is Kristen Nelson, who is also Hugh Howie's agent and Jacinda Wilder and et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. I am open to doing traditional deals overseas, and especially in languages that I could never translate myself, right? Like Thai, for instance. There is no way that I would ever self-publish in Thai because I, ha I would have no idea what I was looking at. None, right? I, w I wouldn't even know how to, how to format it, right? Also, there is no market in digital for Thai that I can access, right? Um, so there are definitely some things that I would uh, consider um, doing there, and we have. I have a question about um, Japanese. I know that um, Hugh Howie, for example, has uh, wool in Japanese now, and it's a little bit different than translating to French and German and stuff because of the characters. Yeah. Have you, have you looked at? I, I know you just mentioned Thai, but have, uh, have you looked at some of those? Like Chinese, Japanese, do you think there's a market there for your stuff over there? I'm sure there's a market there for my stuff. Um, we actually, I don't think I would self-publish in translation in Japanese or Chinese uh, simply because I don't see how I have, um, I, I just I just can't see how I would be able to make sure that I, ha I I can hit the quality I want to. I don't even know how to read reviews of the translators in that language, right? And Google Translate is total crap for Asian languages. You know, it's like I mean, it's it's like it is. It's semi okay for like German and French and Italian. You can get the gist of it. But try translating a review in Japanese. Just go over and like toss it into Google Translate, and you get something like this book was very moist, and you're like, I know it doesn't say that. <laughs> Right. Well, that might be appropriate for the genre. <laughs> well, yes, but you know. I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I've tried to read a lot of gaming and uh, uh, anime-like websites that are in mm -hmm. Japanese and Chinese and stuff like that and tried to Google Translate, and it really doesn't make... I'm pretty sure that's not what they're saying about that. Yeah. I agree. I can't imagine what they say about a David Wright book. I would have to... <laughs> <laughs> It just says also, that's all I'm saying it's moist. <laughs> <laughs> just repeats the word apocalypse over and over. <laughs> John, you had a question. Hey, Courtney. Um, I want to ask, when you're thinking about translating a book to a different language in a new country, um, do you ever investigate the, the business laws and that sort of thing for that country? And if so... Have you ever decided not to translate, have a work translated because of some type of arbitrary regulation that that country imposes on authors or on self-employed people? I have. Uh, I, I, I always check in beforehand. I'm a lawyer, so I can't help it. It's like my, my knee-jerk response is to just see what I'm going in. So I usually try and see, like, is there a price-fixing law? Uh, what do I have to do with um, translators, um, things along those lines. Um, I have not yet found something where I would say I don't want to go into this, but uh, I, I'm sure that it exists. I just haven't, I haven't discovered it yet. I mean, like, we're talking about four countries at this point, so it's not a large sample size. Courtney, I have a question. I want to jump back. You mentioned... Um, you have bloggers that you talk to, mm -hmm. um, and I know that I saw something somewhere one time where you said that you didn't know how to get foreign reviews, um, but it was something that you wanted to look into. It was like probably right when you first started doing your yeah. Training. How did you end up finding those those people and in, in starting that relationship? Well, I actually so um, it depends on the country, but the answer mostly is 
Uh, this is one of those things that Odesk is good for. I went on Odesk. I hired someone to go, and I said, I want you to find me a list of people who have reviewed books by the following authors, and I picked historical romance authors who were like me, okay. you know, in your language. And that's, that's sort of what I did. Um, and just, just, like, search for reviews by bloggers, uh, you know, for Julia Quinn, Lisa Kleypas, Tessa Dare, like, just this list. And I was like, and see, give me, give me a list of the bloggers. And then I just went and got contact information, and I emailed them. Uh, yeah. Okay. Are there foreign translation blog tour companies? I, I don't know. No, not to the best of my knowledge. No, I mean their 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 market is is different than ours. <laughs> they have indie authors, but it's not. You know, they have there. There are so many more books in translation coming out that I just I, I don't think you have the same level of author involvement, um, uh -huh. and 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 the same sort of demand that you see here. Uh, if it exists, I, I I should say actually let me say let me preface go back and put this in front of what I just said like okay. it may exist and it's quite possible that it's staring me right in the face and I don't have any clue uh, because I don't you know it it I don't know I'm the English speaking person who's sort of like fumbling around with Odesk translators um, it might exist maybe it is maybe it does I've just never seen it you're a ton of emails. Introducing themselves to you. Um, uh, um, Courtney, I'd like to go back to your Spanish translations. Now, there's yeah. been a lot of articles that there's um, all sorts of different Spanish, basically, that you mm -hmm. can um, translate into. Did you pick, like, one specifically? And if so, what was the reason you picked that version of Spanish? Um, I picked somebody who lives in Spain. Uh, and I had a uh, proofreader um, who's from Peru, and the goal was to try and like identify those words that are not familiar to those two languages, and to, to hopefully get something that is close. Um, and I, I actually picked somebody who has translated Spanish for Harlequin for years and years and years. And the reason I picked her is because Harlequin does release their books all over, and so they. She's been sort of trained in the trying to write as neutral Spanish as possible. Um, okay, though. Courtney, there's uh, another question from Darren Wearmouth. He says, uh, how do you receive the emails from foreign fans in the native language? How do you handle those? Google Translate. And I tell them that I'm doing that. Uh, German, German, I can actually write myself. And I tell, you know, I, I preface everything with, my German is very bad. I'm sorry if, you know... If this doesn't make sense, let me know, and I'll try and say it another way. Um, for the other languages, I use Google Translate to read, and I use Google Translate to reply, and I tell them in advance I'm doing that, and I put the English translation at the bottom, so if they want to sort of, like, figure it out themselves, they can. Um, that's, that's it. Courtney, I wanted to ask you, um, whenever you have your books translated in Spanish, are you translating um, one version in Castilian Spanish and another version for... Mexican Spanish? Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. And I'm, yeah. Do you just go with Castilian Spanish then, since it's yeah, a I do. Formal? I do. Um, and at some point, if this takes off enough, then I will think to myself about whether I might want to do a localization. Uh, but at this point, I'm just going to see what happens with this one. Will you go so far as to translate it into Spanglish? No. <laughs> I used to live in no. California, and I know a lot of people who speak Spanglish. So. I, I used to live in California, um, and I, I, there's a lot of people who speak Spanglish, but I suspect that the reading market is smaller. Okay. <laughs> you, uh, you almost made Kristen snort live on the air. Then, so. Thanks, close. guys. <laughs> Would you like to try and... Uh, make our guests crack up laughing. I, I have a thoroughly unrelated uh, top uh, question. Well, that doesn't sound like you, Dave. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's you not know. about cricket, is it? <laughs> no, it's not about cricket. I will not uh, bore will our entire audience. Courtney, her favorite <laughs> international cricket team later. So if you're going to ask me cricket questions, this is not going to be a very long answer. No, I, I, I would like to know... Uh, <laughs> That's okay, nobody's is. <laughs> That's the best kind of cricket conversation. 
You know, whenever you talk about crickets, you hear crickets in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my, my qu what I like to ask anytime I'm talking to a successful author is, how, how do you go about getting reviews? Uh, what, what are some of the, the methods you go about doing that? Um... Honestly, you're going to hate my answer because it's not very exciting. I Three things. Uh, I have a list of reviewers um, that I've had for, at this point, a while now of people who I had a relationship with, and I send them uh, copies of the books. I put my books on NetGalley. At the end of my books, I have something saying, you know, thank you for reading this, and one of the little bullet points of things they can do afterwards is, you know, I'd appreciate it if you leave a review, either positive or negative. I don't care. That's it. Okay. Simple. Nothing exciting. Is there a German version of NetGalley out there, or a French or Italian? No, for French, you know, for for that, there's nothing I there's nothing I can do for this except email bloggers. That's all I know about. Um, I have seen people say that they have posted foreign language books on NetGalley and have gotten people to pick it up. I've so, had, uh, reviews come from NetGalley in foreign languages, but I have no idea why. I actually think that, come to think of it, I should probably put my Spanish language book on NetGalley, just mm -hmm. because even in the U.S. there's Spanish, obviously lots and lots of Spanish language readers, so. Right. You might want to consider your French, doing your French translation that way, too, um, because of the Canadian readers. Ah, that's a good point. That's interesting. I never thought of that. Lots of French Canadians, right? Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. I haven't actually taken a look at Canada. Sorry. I've, I've actually I mean, had uh, the a couple of reviews written in French on Google uh, or Amazon CA. Ah, interesting. So yeah. I had not thought of that, but that is obviously something I should think about. Since Brenna mm -hmm. gave me that suggestion, will you be sending her a royalty? <laughs> no. 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 Fr Brenna, I owe her tons. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, Brenna, I, I, uh, uh, we owe each other a handful of drinks, and we will be in a, in some places <laughs> together, and so she can pay up. And since I get drunk really easily, it's good. It's easy. It's cheap for me, you know. She's I am, I am so cheap. I'm like the world's cheapest drunk. Great. <laughs> No, I do. I owe her big time, so yeah. Glad to give you the tip. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. Thank part you. of my huge debt to you. <laughs> I have a, another question for you on the translations, going back to translations again. Do you change your cover art for each of the different um, languages? Do you use the same cover art across all of them? Uh, I have for French, German, Spanish. Those are, yeah, for French, German, and Spanish. Um, simply because I go on the subgenre list and I look at historical romances and I ask myself, is this cover going to fit in the cover in, in the market? Um, and for, for for those, it has in Italian. Uh, I am not seeing historical romance covers with a single woman on the cover so much. They're all clinch covers. So I feel like if I do Italian, I'm going to have to do clinch cover just to fit to to hit that genre um, base. So. But it's all based on what I see on, on the market and what's selling. Okay. Um, there's a couple more questions, but um, I just wanted to point out that Darren Wearmouth agreed with me about the cricket, and nobody else appreciates <laughs> the beauty of a perfect cover drive. He's English, so he's, he's got some class about him. Uh, but Amy Garnett said, uh, question for the other panelists, do any of you have any translations in the work? So that's for you people. I've got a German translation out right now through Amazon Crossing that has been amazing me with how well it's been doing. I'm still waiting for 47 North to get back to me on whether they'll do a translation for the books they published for us. Trish, can you tell us if you have the same experience that Courtney had and that they wanted to translate your reference to poking? Um, <laughs> Well, no, um, uh, Amazon Crossing, they basically take over everything, so I have, like, absolutely no input into um, any of the translation. But they they wow. did ask me, you know, for input on the cover. I had to approve the cover and all that. And I will say that they did the 
Um, they kept my same cover because they felt it would translate really well in the German store. But they have changed some of the other covers for some of the authors, and they've changed some of the titles too. And I think the funniest one I've heard is the one um, for Tracy Brogan. Her title, which it was like the top Kindle bestseller for Montlake Romance, was A Crazy Little Thing Called Love. And the German translation is something like, Why Seahorses Wear Sneakers in the Summertime. <laughs> that is the best title ever. <laughs> yeah, great title. <laughs> uh, don't ask me how they came out with it, but I mean, that's literally her title for that book. And um, the covers are completely different, too. The cover for um, the U.S. book is basically two people sitting on a dock with bare feet kind of dangling in the ocean. And the covers for the other one is like seashells and seahorses. But mine, they did like a one-for-one -one title, so it's exactly the same title in German. Yeah, I and I will talk Trish last week or two weeks ago, and you said I should look into it. I contacted a few companies, and they are all over the place in terms of quotes. And it's I like Courtney's method better of finding translators, you know, who's published already because what they were coming up with was kind of scary. Yeah, um, we're going to have Lisa Marie Rice on. She used to actually be a translator, and she mm -hmm. started up a recent translating company. She's kind of going through a family thing right now, so she couldn't come on this show, but we are going to be scheduling her on, and um, she'll be talking about a lot of this stuff as well. She's good people. Yeah, I have a, uh, as to Kristen's point, I have a writing community on Google+, and um, some of my members were looking into... Um, having their works translated and one of the people had contacted a translator who quoted them I forget what the cent per word it was but it ended up being over $100,000 for his oh, book yeah. I, I got yeah. one of those the other night and I, the same night I also got like a $2,000 one so which I would translate this book for $100,000 why I pay that <laughs> I was like what's going on here I will learn other languages and translate your books for $100,000. <laughs> now, I believe from what Lisa said in the email she sent me, and she can verify if I'm remembering this right, is that um, her company, which has a range of different um, translator charges on average about uh, 10 cents per word, and that includes a proofreader in that language. Carl will translate your books into Australian for a very low fee. <laughs> I will. <laughs> hey, he offered me that too. Right, man. Let's do mine the first. All you have to do is Australia. add a reference. Sure Australian English and a historical romance are going to go that well together. Is and a kangaroo on the cover. <laughs> it's, not the most, it's not the most beautiful language. Okay, um, Courtney, so another question. You've been, um, obviously, know the historical market pretty well over there. Do you know what other um, genres tend to do fairly well, say, um, in German? Have you paid any attention to that? Zero. I'm so sorry. Uh, the easiest way to tell, though, is just to go to Amazon.de and, like, look at the category, like, find the categories to the best that, you know, eat, you know, look for, you know, if you George R. R. Martin and click on his books and then see what categories they put them in and then look at how the books are selling, like what they're ranked um, relative to the whole store. And that'll give you some idea. If you write in a category and like the number one book in the category is like 293 in the store, um, that tells you something. Um, versus if the number one book in the category is like number two in the whole Kindle store. So. Is that how you decided, you know, with um, the French and the other other languages you chose to translate in? Did you go to the stores and see how yeah. well the historical romances yeah. were selling? I do. I do. That's 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 important. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions in the comments? I was just going to point out that we have 52 live viewers on the website at the moment. I'm not sure about if there's people over on YouTube, but it's pretty good. Thanks for yeah. coming, everyone. all cricket fans. And, well, yeah. And I usually when they're not being silly like sometimes we can be, that means they're really listening. So yeah, that's uh, like a real show as well. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, There's not nearly enough crude comments in here. I, I'm disappointed yeah. in you all. <laughs> I did my part. 
<laughs> no, I, I meant no. I, I meant, she's talking about poking. No, but you know how not funny. you all. I meant the uh, the audience. The people oh, expect okay. more oh, from the audience. Okay. Been shocking. They've not swat, They've not done anything. There's been no talk about dinosaur erotica. No. Not a single Nazi reference either. It's just <laughs> yeah. amazing. God. We try and go easy on the people the first time they come on, Courtney. Like, Kristen and Brenna have already been through the gauntlet of pain, so they, they know what to expect, including all the following. You know, if this is a gauntlet of pain, and... I think your pain threshold might be a little low. <laughs> well, we are male. Well, we he does are, play cricket. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's like your drinking threshold. <laughs> <laughs> right. Carl's also into cheap pain. As compared to expensive? Well, dominatrix isn't such. <laughs> so I no, hear. Uh, Darren, okay. has offered to, Aaron, Darren has offered to drop the tone very quickly if we want. And I, <laughs> and I believe I have seen him um, outside of these hangouts, and I know what he's like. Courtney, I have That's... a question. Getting back to being serious, because, you know, I am so serious. God uh, damn it. <laughs> Um, this is actually not directly related to translations, but it's kind of related to the genre of romance. I've noticed that the British covers, the British have seemed to have more of a different taste with uh -huh. covers. Have you ever been tempted to change your covers for your UK? Of course, your covers are probably not, don't have a problem in, in the UK, but... I've had a couple comments in reviews where they said, this book is great, except for the cover. <laughs> so it's made me wonder if maybe I should consider getting a different cover for the UK because uh, they have different preferences for their romance Do you consider yours covers. too offensive or something? I think they don't like... Uh, Kissing. Yes, they don't like the kissy covers. Yeah. Um, How I dare there be affection in a romance <laughs> book? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, know I, how much the, you know how much the British love affection. <laughs> right now, right now. I, I really haven't thought about That's doing it for the UK just because it would be a pain in the butt mm -hmm. to set up, and I don't want to. Um, and that's, I, I suppose that if I were being like super businessy about it, then I would like do it for one book and do A/B testing. But then, how do I tell if it's maybe just like a sucky cover and what? I mean, I don't know. It is yeah. meh. And how do you do a cover which properly represents people living out lives of quiet misery with each other forever and ever? Amen. I don't know, Dave. How would you do a cover that would appeal all your life? <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Family photos, I don't know. Well, we know what Dave's um, title of his romance would be. We do? Yeah, it would be uh, How to Win the Marriage War. <laughs> Is that right, Dave? She's making reference I'm, to a horrible podcast I do. <laughs> and unfortunately, there would be no happy ending at the end of his romance. Everyone would die. <laughs> oh, that would not be a romance. <laughs> no, that would not be a romance. Yeah, that um, be a actually, romance. that brings up a, an interesting question, uh, Courtney. Do you find that the different um, foreign markets are, are looking for different things in your books? I mean, uh, do you find that they're that they're more likely to like one type of a book than another type of a book in your okay. historicals? I can't answer that question. I just don't have enough information. Uh, sorry. So first of all, I have not had French and Spanish books out long enough to claim to anything near expertise. And secondly, the only books I can put out are mine. So mm -hmm. I don't have any idea how people who write other kinds of books perform. Right? I just don't have enough, I don't have enough information to answer that. Yeah, I, I meant actually in your own books. Like, you do write historical romance, but they're not all um, regency, are they? Aren't they kind of spread across they're the all, different... They're all... Everything that I've written has been Victorian. Oh, it um, has been Victorian. With the exception of one novella uh, that took place ten years before the very first series that I ever wrote. Everything that I've written has been in Victorian times. Um, and I... Yeah. And it's very difficult for me to say if one book, okay, so first of all, like, I, can com I, I can't compare sales for my, of Harlequin books to my books because I am better at selling my books, right? I sell a lot more copies than Harlequin ever did, and I'm glad about that, but, like, you know, like, is it, is it the book? Is it me? I don't know, right? Um, the, the, longer, the farther I go on, the larger a fan base I have. And so if a book sells better, is it, is it the book, or is it just because more people now know about me, and so I get, you know, a bigger bump in the beginning? I don't know. 
Yeah, that's true. It, it, what what um, do you have any ideas why you do better on your own than with a publisher? Is it oh, with, yes, is it to do with pricing? Is it to do with uh, that you're able to write a lot more and not have to sit on a book for a year? Uh, no, it's pricing matters. Um, <clears throat> covers matter. Like, okay, so can I tell you something about my Harlequin books that just drives me up the wall? We they, love nothing more. <laughs> okay, so they, they send the covers out, and they change the aspect ratio in the cover, so it's stressed. <laughs> like, every single fucking Harlequin book on Amazon, oh my God. aspect ratio is wrong. And it's, it's like, if you compare the cover on their website to the cover on their... I mean, seriously, everyone go look right now. Like, go look at Unveiled and look at the print version versus the digital version. Why the fuck can't you get the aspect ratio right, guys? <laughs> you know, this isn't hard, right? In fact, one of my covers for one of my books on Harlequin, they couldn't, they, they, they actually posted the version that didn't have the title and my name on it on Amazon. And Are you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> it, and, and literally, like, it took them forever to correct, and I think it reverted at some random point uh, in the last year. Uh, hold on a sec. Yeah, that, that, that does look like hell. <laughs> I'm uh, at it now. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's just like, um, yeah, I, I, I no, I, I, I can't find it. Um, but in any event, like, yeah, so, so there's that. Um, there's the fact. Is Unraveled your, is it indie or is it Harlequin? Unraveled is mine. Okay, why are, why is part of the, why is the product description in English? If I'm looking at the DE page. Because that's an English language book. So, oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 I mean, obviously all my English language books are up there. Um, okay. The, the, but then your the title bio is still in German because that's how it is. Yeah, Author because they're pulling, it from, they're pulling it from Author Central in Germany. In Germany. I gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, Last summer, you gave a presentation at RWA about metadata. Do uh -huh. you do anything in particular for your translations in regards to your metadata, or? Um, like actually, yeah. The, the hardest thing that I had was trying to figure out what keywords to use okay. um, in foreign languages, uh, because you know I don't speak the language very well, and I can't come up with the same keywords. And so the one thing I found useful is if you go to like Amazon.de and you start typing in like so for me uh, I'm on Amazon Germany so I'm gonna start typing in Liebesroman which is romance novel in Germany and then I look at what comes what the you know the, the, they they do the cert, the auto completion thing I look at what comes up and that's the stuff that people are searching for right so. You know, if I if I search for historische Liebesroman, what comes after that? Those are good keywords to choose. So that's one of the things that I've discovered. Okay. That's the only useful thing I can offer about metadata in translation. Do we have any more questions on the um, on the website? Anyone look for a while? Uh, I would like to ask, uh, John just sent an email regarding uh, doing a show on newsletters. So, uh, Courtney, uh, what is your newsletter strategy? How often do you uh, email out to people and what sorts of things you do to keep it fresh and not spammy? Uh, I only email people when I have a new book out. That's my email strategy. That's, okay. that's it. I don't do newsletters other than that. Uh, I know people that do. I um, The thought of doing that makes me want to like curl up in a ball and die. It sounds awful. Um, some people, and, and that's just like it's like like the same thing like writing blog posts. Like tell me like you, you point a gun at me like write a blog post now. I'll be like oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I just don't. Right. So so I feel I don't know. I guess I just feel it feels to me it feels like no matter what I'd be doing I'd be intruding on people if I was sending other stuff. So I don't worry about keeping it fresh. Like I I tell people don't sign I mean sign up because you want to know when my next book is out that is all I care about if you don't want to know when the next book is out don't sign up for my newsletter I don't care right all, the only thing I want is people actually wanting to buy my books if you want to buy my books I want you to buy my books we have a good relationship okay so Courtney will not be on that episode yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know I'd be I'd, I'd be totally useless totally useless. <laughs> 
I'd be Actually, like, she might be a good person to have on that episode because I know several authors who do adopt that same strategy of, hey, I only bug people when I've got a book out. Yeah. Uh, I have, how, about, how about you, Brennan and Kristen? I send out newsletters when I have pretty covers to release and a buy link. Um, I've only sent out one newsletter, and I actually, um, it was not regarding my new release because the book had already been out, but I was kind of using it as an incentive to uh, get more sub people to subscribe to the newsletter by saying I would release the next few pages of the next book, uh, the first few pages. So I got a lot of people subscribing for that, so I've only sent out that one, and then I'm going to send out one in a little while here to announce the next book. <clears throat> cool. I, yesterday I said that I have two covers that I want to share, and if you sign up for the newsletter, I'll drop it pretty soon, and I had a few dozen people sign up yesterday, so that's a big thing, my covers. And that's, those are big numbers for me. So. No, a few dozen in a couple days is big numbers for anyone. Almost yeah. anyone. Well, now I feel like we're pestering people. We do, we do a weekly one, but uh, I put, uh, I, put oh my God. I got the that. goners one. I signed up after <laughs> I did. I signed up. I wanted to see what you were doing. And do you like it? I did. It was hey goners, and I was like, all right, I, I like this. It, <laughs> my, There's all kinds of stuff in there. Well, orig or originally in 2012 we were doing it at least a week, uh, but now in 2013 we slowed down, and we actually yeah. heard from people that. We're not getting emails, and they're like, "Hey, I want an email." So I was like, "Okay." So it w it was like uh, it's become it, it's not to 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 us anyway, Sean and I. It's not you know just a mailing list to buy. It's a, a weekly conversation with your readers to 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 keep right. to stay in their heads and to to talk about things they're interested in. I I think it is uh. It's definitely something I, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, how various people do it, and everybody does it a little different, and there, there's nothing wrong with any one way, like, you know, sending just when you have a book out, uh, but I, you know, I think everybody, like, likes different things about it, so I, I guess it really depends on your audience. Uh, Louis C.K. does great newsletters. Uh, yeah, he, he, yeah. Only, he only emails when he has something out, but his emails are fucking brilliant. So subscribe to his if you really want to see Master at Work. <laughs> hey, Dave. Uh, Dave, can you what? try to get him on the show? I tried to get him on self-publishing podcast, and uh, oh, hasn't happened yet. I'm sorry. I'll keep trying. I will get him. <laughs> we, uh, I, I, I set up uh, the shirtless dudes of the uh, self-publishing <laughs> roundtable calendar newsletter. Kristen signed up nine times. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna have a negative, uh, negative subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how she did it. She signed up nine separate times. <laughs> she probably okay, heard that you did your push-ups or something. I have a question for Courtney that actually doesn't have anything to do with translations either. It actually Ooh. has to do with her books. Um, so uh, when you moved into self-publishing away from your um, Harlequin, did you? try to do any transference between um, the worlds of your Harlequin or were those um, off limits to you? Nope. Did you try to bring some of those readers over into your self-published stuff that way? Oh, hell yeah. Of course I did. It would be foolish not to. No, I actually, I have a series where the first two books are from Harlequin and the third book in the series is mine and there's a novella that's mine. Um, and it's awkward because trying to drive sales to that last book is sort of like trying to push a train uphill using a <laughs> 10-foot pole. Um, but, you know, there you are. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I absolutely, uh, there are people who have been reading me from the beginning. Um, there, are, there are months when I have a new release when my old books from Harlequin sell better than some of their front list titles from that month. Um, and this is for books that are three years, three, four years old now. Um, so I absolutely do have readers who are going back and reading everything that I have and who and people who stayed with me from the beginning and went through. Readers don't care how your books come out. Can you buy back books. your rights to the Harlequin books? Uh, ask me about that later. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I'm thinking if you're dropping $10,000 on translation, it might be a worthwhile investment. We, we actually, I, I have actually, in fact, made the offer to buy back my rights. But the truth is they're selling enough copies that... Um, they don't want to give it up. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay. <laughs> How many uh, separate series do you have out, Courtney? You've got, what, three or four? Three. Three. 
I'm on really? right now. Are they are they all connected in some way, or are they a separate standalone series? Nope. I wish I could write things that were connected, but I get really sick of people, and I don't want them to show up afterwards. Like, oh. like you know, the readers love it though. The readers yeah. love it when it's like you know a twenty book series, and you're still seeing like the couple from the first three books that they love so much. Um, I I just get sick of stuff. I'm just like, no, I'm done with you. Kill and, them and, all and, off. Well, <laughs> that's, I'm afraid that's what I would do, right? Like, you know, <laughs> if you want to bring people... Here's, here's the thing, right? Like, I don't like bringing people back in for the sort of, like, I'm going to trot out this couple and show how happy they are, and, and nothing happens but happiness. Happiness is boring, right? You know, I happiness, agree. Happiness I agree. is for the end of the fucking book, right? The, the middle of the book needs to be misery. Yeah, never bored. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so you know, I, if I bring these people back and they're all happy all the time, like it's serving almost no narrative purpose. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like if I if I had like a twenty book series, I I, I don't know, I'd have to like cause drama or something. I don't want it. I don't know. I too much drama, I would die. I, I got one word die. for you: cancer. No. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Freaking historical romance, like the, the no, no. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to go into brainstorming sessions with Dave. He tries to kill all your main no, characters. Okay, but, okay, so my husband is a doctor, and every time I say, I'm like, this book doesn't have enough conflict, his answer every single time, okay, he discovers that he has chlamydia. I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> no! Just give everyone lupus. <laughs> it's never lupus. <laughs> but you know, he's, he's right. He's, he's like, he's like, it's great conflict because then he has an STD. How do they have sex? I'm like, no, that is not gonna happen ever. You you need to co-write one with your husband. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah probably don't enter into brainstorming with any of us ever. <laughs> well, well, Trish is probably safe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Trish would be safe. Yeah, I, I, none yeah. of the men. I mean, we haven't affected guys. Houston not, not enough yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> yeah, they'll like, either want to kill your like, hero off, like, or they'll want to cure yeah. your kill your heroine off, or well, they'll want to like kill a secondary time. hero up. If your book's all Victorian, that was the golden age of cricket. I would just have the guys. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no, oh, oh, blowing blowing off dates. Oh, Cut Carl's speed. Cut his speed. I'm I happy. I'm happy to, to work with you on. I'm happy to work with you on adding in cricket into your book. <laughs> you, you, for free. He works for the cricket uh, society. <laughs> well, we are over an over an hour now. Maybe it's a good time to end the stream. And I, and yeah. I'm Paul's that, talking about we, cricket. It's always a good we, time to end. Yeah, we did. Uh, I think we killed the website as well. The comments oh, not working anymore. Uh, That's perfect. We've done a good job of bringing people in. Sign that we did our job. Close up. Before you close up, Wade, I just want to remind everyone that the show will be on iTunes and audio download in about an hour's time because I'm awesome. And to go over <laughs> iTunes, and please, so please, please, please leave us a review and like our videos on YouTube and maybe subscribe as well so then you don't have to... Um, and you can just skip over the parts about cricket. It'd be all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, can. So are we having an after party? Is there anyone out in the audience who wants to do an after party? Well, well the website's the down. We don't know. We don't know uh, <laughs> the site is down. Oh, the website's right. down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Carl, Carl needs to pay his website <laughs> hosting. Yeah. No, I think it was Post just email. the, the crash so the server. People. I think it just crashed because there were so many people that showed up. In the <laughs> they heard I was back this week. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, well, I, I do want to take this moment to thank... Courtney, very much. You're very insightful in, in putting up with our shenanigans. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, learned a lot. And and we classed the join up by having uh, uh, Brennan and Kristen yeah. on, too. So. And, Brennan. and yeah. what the audience didn't know is that we were trying to make those two laugh as well. So in <laughs> secret. They are yeah. cool people. They're so very cool. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> but you come back for more. So. You can come back. <laughs> Don't pretend like you did. And what, so what girls... What Carl's talking about is they were doing all sorts of stuff in the chat, which you can't see online, to try to get Brennan and Kristen to laugh out loud. Yes. I want you to know I read all of it, and I didn't laugh. Not that much. Or maybe, maybe a little bit. But. Nice. Carl, you need to post the nude pics you have. Yeah. 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 That would make everyone laugh, huh? <laughs> All right. I mean, that, would, that would frighten people. It's that <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, there's no after party, I guess, because we have no idea who wants to come. We might stick around and chat for a few minutes, but All right. sorry. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Hopefully you'll come visit us again someday. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll uh, see you all next week. Who's on next week, real quick? Quick plug. I don't think we actually have it quite set up yet. We're still making the arrangements. It may be a show on Amazon's algorithms, um, but I don't know. We'll get everybody lined up in time. We're trying to line up a few people for that. We've got a couple, but we're we'll be talking amongst more. ourselves next week for an hour. We might do, which is probably one you want to skip. So. Yeah, well, it's kind of like another podcast I watch, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, say hi, say, say hi to you. Say hi to your mom's for me. <laughs> Bye, guys.